those who are joining us uh, via the live stream. We're glad you're with us today. Matt was going to be up here doing the welcome, but he is downstairs in kids' worship this morning. So he thought if he got a chance, he would try to scoot up here and then scoot back down. But uh, I knew that if he wasn't here at 10, I was just going to go ahead and get up here and, and start us off. So, um, Lord, we're grateful for this time to be together in your house. We thank you for your love and for your grace. We ask you, Holy Spirit, fill this place. Lord, we're here to meet with you. We're, we long for your presence. We long just to be in your presence. We're here to honor you, to glorify your name. We lift you up. So, Lord, we do praise you today. We ask the Holy Spirit to prepare us, help us to be prepared for worship, help us to enter in. We ask that you would help us to clear away distractions, those things that would take our minds elsewhere. The world is a distracting enough place as it is, and so, Lord, we come today to concentrate, to focus our efforts, to come together in the house of God, this particular location of that larger house, this particular outpost of the kingdom of heaven, uh, to join our voices together, to join our hearts together, to join our prayers together, to listen together for your voice, Lord. And so we invite you, Holy Spirit, to speak during this time. In all the different aspects of the service, we know that this is far more than just a sermon, uh, that you speak in so many ways. We ask you to speak in and through the music, in and through the just the time to be together. Lord, we, we need to hear from you today. We long to hear from you. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we pray for those who could not be with us today for various reasons, different challenges that are happening right now in their lives, people who would normally be here. So many who cannot be here physically uh, right now because of this whole COVID-19 uh, situation. We pray for each one, uh, wherever they are right now, whatever they're dealing with. We ask that you would comfort them, encourage them, help them to be very aware of your presence. We know that you're not limited uh, by time or by space. And so I pray, Lord, there'd be a real sense of unity as some are here on location and some are, are in remote locations, but there would be unity in the spirit. So we give this service to you, Lord Jesus. Father, we glorify you in and through the holy name of your Son. And Holy Spirit, we ask you to, to, to lead here today. All in the name of Jesus. Lord, is everyone ready to have some fun today? Uh, let's all stand up if you can, and uh, we're just going to praise the Lord. And I just want to let you all know, you know, it's okay to clap your hands and dance in church. I don't know what you've been told before, but it's all right to do that. So let's have some fun. Yeah. 
you here today, Lord, just to reveal yourself more and more and take us deeper and deeper into your presence. Thank you, Father. Amen. My soul longed and even yearned for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. The bird also has found a house, and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. How blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. How blessed is the man whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. Passing through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The early rain also covers it with blessings. And they go from strength to strength. 
every one of them appears before God in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God, and look upon the face of your anointed, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand outside. I would rather stand at the threshold of the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, how blessed is the man who trusts in you. I got peace like a river. I got peace like a river. I got peace like a river in my soul. I got peace like a river. I got peace like a river. I got peace like a river in my soul.
Oh, oh, oh. 
last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and proclaimed, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart shall flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the spirit, which those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Father, we pray that you would pour out your spirit, living water, that you would flood this dry, parched land, that wherever we are dry and parched inside, where we need to be replenished recharged by your presence. We ask you to pour out yourself by your spirit into our innermost beings. But as you said, you would release the water of life. It would become in us like a fountain of water welling up to eternal life. So we pray for refreshing. We pray for the release of your spirit Come, come Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. We ask you to come Holy Spirit, change the atmosphere. Come, Holy Spirit. Lord, we long for a great awakening, a great move of your spirit. It's been so long. An enemy seeks to discourage us and to tell us it's not coming. It's not going to come. Just to get used to it. To not expect any more, but Lord, we know that you are the God of more. You are the God of life. And we ask you to release your life. Release your spirit. We ask for refreshing and renewing. Come, Holy Spirit, come.
Thank you, Lord. We're told in the Word of God that the Holy Spirit inspired people to write what we now know as the Bible, the Scriptures. Inspired breathed into, he breathed his very breath, the breath of life into human beings who wrote what they had been shown. The record of God's encounter with his people, the record of God's revealing himself to his people. As we look into the scripture today, we are looking at the heart of God. We're looking at his own revelation and we're looking through the eyes today of John, the beloved disciple, the one who was closest to Jesus, understood his heart the best, it seems, the one who leaned against his chest at the Lord's Supper, the one who was there at that last meal, the one who had been transformed from a firebrand, from a knucklehead who wanted to burn up a Samaritan village to this man who proclaims the love of God in such a powerful way. So we're looking at the letters of John as we speak about walking in the light. As we continue this series, we're in part four, 1 John 2, 18 through 29 today. Remember, these are the words of God, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And I would invite each one of us just to open ourselves to receive from the Lord whatever he has for us today. God has the ability to work through imperfect, flawed people. I'm so glad for that because I don't want to get in his way. So we ask you, Holy Spirit, to move today in a special way, going above and beyond what any one person could do or say. We ask you to speak to us today directly, Holy Spirit. Amen. Before we get into the reading of the passage uh, today, we're going to take it in bits and pieces. I just want to uh, talk a little bit about why we're here looking at these letters. There seem to be two main reasons why John wrote these letters. Uh, one, he wanted to deepen the spiritual life of his readers. He emphasized this fellowship. He emphasizes abiding. These are themes all throughout the letters of John. Fellowship and abiding. Fellowship, that Greek word is koinonia. It's a deep fellowship, deep involvement with a real genuine concern and involvement with another person. Uh, it's, it's deeper than what we tend to think of as fellowship. Uh, it's, it's this deep relationship, uh, real concern in walking with another person. Uh, John emphasizes this is all through the letters. We see it again and again and again. We see these themes come and go throughout the letters. And uh, he also emphasizes abiding. And we're going to be uh, seeing that again today as we walk through this letter, 1 John, this, this sense of abiding and living in, remaining with the Father. It's all about relationship. Fellowship is about relationship. And John, uh, speaking uh, from his experience with Christ, is emphasizing fellowship, abiding, staying in uh, the presence of God, staying in the Father through His Son, Jesus Christ. And we see that belief and behavior are inextricably woven together. Our behavior doesn't save us. Our behavior is a result of our being saved. We were created for good works beforehand, that God prepared beforehand that we would walk in them. We are saved, and because we're saved, we begin to act like Jesus. That's the way it's supposed to work, right? We don't try to act like Jesus in order to get saved. Never works. That's a very common mistake. We, we are saved, and then we're transformed by the work of the Holy Spirit, and we begin to act like Jesus. We begin to look like God himself. The heart of God himself is expressed and revealed through us. We're made in his image and likeness to begin with. That image and likeness were flawed, marred through the fall, sin, and Jesus came to redeem us from our sin, restore us to relationship with the Father so we can begin to look more like him again. So belief and behavior go together. And we see these themes again and again in these letters. So the first main purpose to deepen the spiritual life of his readers. The second, to deny false teaching. 
There was false teaching which was gaining ground in the first, cen- first century. It didn't take long uh, for there to be false teaching. Uh, it was denying that God had become man in Christ. Uh, there are different forms of it, but uh, the, the general term for it is Gnosticism. It comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. Gnosis, knowledge. And the idea was somehow you're saved by knowledge of certain things, certain mysteries. And yet Gnosticism typically denied the incarnation. All right, so it, it put forth a substitute for salvation. Uh, you're saved by your knowledge, your awareness of certain mysteries, and they would say that those, some of those are spiritually discerned, but they pushed the incarnation to the side. It was about knowledge. And John is fighting against that all through uh, these letters. So a review, real quickly, of chapter 1. We saw in 1 John 1, 1 through 4, the wonder and marvel at the incarnation. John is still uh, stunned by what he had experienced uh, with Christ. He knew him in the flesh. He saw God in the flesh, and he, he marvels at it. And we see that in one, one run-on sentence, verses 1 through 4, at the beginning of uh, this letter, chapter 1. Verses 5 through 10 of chapter 1. Uh, John declares God is light and in him is no darkness at all. There's no compromising with evil. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. We talked, uh, we talked a lot about saints and sinners uh, through this time. Saints walk in the light. That is, they walk in fellowship with God and with other believers. Sinners walk in darkness. Hatred toward others can blind us to the light. All right, so saints, those redeemed by the blood of Christ, being transformed into the image of Christ by the activity of the Holy Spirit are walking in the light. Sinners walk in the darkness. And if we are fully enveloped by that darkness, that leads to hatred toward others and that blinds us to the light. If saints can sin, and we can, uh, we can confess and be forgiven and wash clean. He is faithful and just. He will forgive our sin and wash us clean from all unrighteousness. That's the promise uh, in the first chapter of First John. So saints, if you're a saint, doesn't mean you're perfect. It just means you're holy. That's all. You've been made holy by the blood of Christ. You can still sin, but you have a nature that is inclined toward righteousness, holiness, inclined toward God. Your desire is to hit the mark, hit the bullseye you're aiming at being like Christ. You may miss it, which is sin. The most common word for sin is missing that mark, like an archer shooting at a target. We may miss that mark, but our desire is to hit the mark. When you're a sinner, when you're spiritually dead, your desire is to please your master who is the devil. You serve sin. You are are mastered by it. And so your inclination is to sin. Your inclination is toward evil, not toward God. This is why it doesn't work to to, to be a sinner trying to make your way to salvation on your own. Because you're mastered by your sin. It never works. You can't, you can't make yourself holy enough to be accepted by God. It doesn't work that way. You have to be redeemed by the blood of Christ. And so when we deny the incarnation, we deny the gospel. And this is what Gnosticism was doing. If we become saved by our knowledge, now we're in serious trouble. All right, so this is what we looked at in chapter 1. Chapters 2, 1 through 6. Uh, John reminds us, who we are, and who God is. And he does that so we may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the expiation for our sins. Two key words here we looked at. Advocate, we get the English word paraclete from this word, Greek word. Uh, The paraclete, the one who comes alongside us in the different translations for it, comforter, strengthener, uh, advocate, different translations are used in English. Uh, but the one who walks alongside us, comes alongside to, to help us, to, to aid us, to, to be our advocate with the Father and so forth. And expiation, the covering or the mercy seat. Christ is our advocate. Christ the righteous, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the expiation. He's both. And so these are two key concepts in, in John's theology, John's understanding of who Christ is. Uh, he's, he's with us and he promised there'd be another advocate. We looked at that last time. And that is the Holy Spirit who, who comes to live in us. Jesus uh, sent it to the Father to be our advocate at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. The Holy Spirit comes to be our advocate here on the earth and it actually indwells us. The evidence that we know Jesus is that we keep his commandments. 
All right, now remember, we're talking about Gnosticism, knowledge. You're saved by your knowledge. Well, John has a different approach to that. But we do know Christ, but we know him in a way that is revealed by the Holy Spirit. There's an inner witness that comes from the Holy Spirit. It's the spirit of truth. And the evidence that we know Christ is that we keep his commandments. Behavior and belief inextricably woven together. We're not saved by keeping his commandments. We keep his commandments because we're saved. All right, we, we need to make sure we don't put the cart before the horse uh, in this, which is what we so uh, often do. He who says he abides in him, in Christ, ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Seems straightforward enough, right? He who says he abides in Christ ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. You can't claim to be a follower of Jesus while at the same time you're living in a way that totally dishonors his name. It doesn't matter how many times you want to put a label in front of your name or after your name and say, I'm a follower of Jesus or I'm a Christian. If you're not living in a way that honors him, there's something seriously wrong. So he who says he abides in Christ ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. The evidence that you belong to him is, is in your behavior. But Jesus said you'll know them by their fruit. A good tree cannot produce uh, bad fruit. A bad tree won't produce good fruit. Uh, as noted uh, earlier, we are saints, not sinners, but we can sometimes sin. Chapter 2, verses 7 through 17, we are the beloved. So we see the heart of God here. John had come to understand the heart of Christ. We are the beloved. He addresses those uh, reading his letter with this term. Uh, God loves us. God loves you. A lot of people struggle with that. Maybe because of their sin, they feel like they're not worthy of God's love. Well, you're not worthy of God's love, but he loves you anyway. That's why it's a gift. He loves you. Yes, you've sinned. Yes, you've fallen short of his glory, but he loves you, and so he sent his son to redeem you. You are the beloved. So start to thank yourself as the beloved. I am loved. I am loved by God. It's a life-transforming concept, isn't it? I'm, I'm truly loved by the creator of the universe. Now, there's an old commandment and a new commandment to love that John talked about. To love is to walk in the light with God and uh, the change that is made in us by the Holy Spirit makes this possible. Again, I'm just hitting some high points here as we, as we catch up to where we are today in the letter. Uh, we see affectionate fatherly advice uh, from John. Our sins are forgiven. Older and younger believers are encouraged. And uh, we love the world as God loves it. We're told to do that, but not love the world on its own terms. We're told to reject the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And the world passes away in the lust of it, but, those, but he who does the will of God abides forever. And that brings us up to today's verses, starting with verse 18. And we're going to take them a little bit at a time as we go through. Rather than read the whole passage, go back and, and take a look at it. Children, it is the last hour. And as you've heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. Actually, what John says here, and it's interesting, he says, a last hour. He leaves the definite article off. He doesn't say it's the last hour. He, says it's the es he talks about the eschaton, the end. But he says it's a last hour. We're in the end times. Are you aware we've been in the end times ever since Jesus walked the earth? We're in the end times. Have been for 2,000 years. This is the end of the age. We're, we're coming to the end of the age. Uh, Jesus said he didn't know exactly when he was going to return. Only the Father knew that. So John doesn't presume to know when the last hour is. All right? So there's some humility here. It says we're in the last hour. We're drawing near the end. He's acknowledging that we're in the last days, but he's not presuming to know exactly when the last day will be. How many stories have you read through the years of people who've gone off and lived in a cave you know, somewhere, and uh, they predicted the exact date of Jesus' return, and then they look very foolish uh, afterward? It's happened a lot, hasn't it? So John doesn't make that mistake. He's like, okay, little children, we're in, we're in the last hour here. But he respects Christ enough and the Father enough to not presume to predict the, the precise last hour. So we're in the last days. And, and a feature of the last days is Antichrist. 
or antichrists. We only find these words in the letters of John, interestingly enough. First John and Second John. We see antichrists and antichrists. Um, we never see that term in the book of Revelation, for example. Um, we only see them here. It, it does appear that a person will be used at the end by Satan to deceive the nations and as a focal point for opposition to God's purpose. Revelation doesn't use the term, but Paul does talk about the man of lawlessness. We did a whole series on, uh, on that, right? The mystery of lawlessness, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He, he talks about the man of lawlessness who will, who will claim to be God in the last days. Paul tells us he's being restrained for now, but he will be released. Uh, that restraint will be removed, and we, and we spend a lot of time talking about this. I believe the restraint is government. And we've seen what happens with lawlessness uh, recently in our nation, haven't we? When governors and mayors do not enforce the law, look what happens. There's lawlessness. People get hurt. Property is destroyed. This is what happens. There's chaos. Uh, that's a very good way to overthrow a nation, if that's your goal, by the way. Just destroy all law and create chaos so you can replace what was there with something else. And that is the goal of those involved in the lawlessness right now. So lawlessness is being restrained for now. Apparently there will be an individual that Paul talks about, the man of lawlessness, uh, who will appear in the last days when it's really close to the end and uh, will become a focal point. People will think that he's God. He's going to claim to be God. They're going to think he's doing miracles and, and uh, he's awesome and, and many will follow him. So John tells us, so now many antichrists have come. Well, isn't that interesting? So it's not just one person. It's not, you know, the Antichrist. We talk about the Antichrist, the Antichrist, you know, capital A. Uh, he says, now many Antichrists have come. This is 2,000 years ago. Antichrists are unclean, evil, demonic spirits who are against Christ. Antichrist. It's pretty straightforward. <laughs> and this is evidence that it's the last hour. We're in the last days because there are antichrist spirits who are working against Christ and against his, his kingdom. And now we shouldn't be surprised by that because the, the very name Satan or Satan in Hebrew means adversary. So Satan is our adversary and he hates Christ. He's the adversary of Christ. He hates us because we belong to Christ. He is working against us because we belong to Jesus. He's the accuser of our brothers. Revelation 12.10. Satan, the devil, is the adversary, the accuser of our brethren. Satan, you could say, would, is sort of the chief antichrist spirit, isn't he? he he's, the, uh, he's the enemy who fights against Christ. All right, so uh, this is a spiritual battle we're involved in, a spiritual warfare we're involved in. So we shouldn't be surprised that there are already many Antichrist, and John's going to talk more about this uh, later on in the letter about Antichrist spirits. And Jesus warned in John 16, 1 through 4, I have said all this to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do this because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you that when, the, when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you of them. Jesus promised us opposition in this world. Look, if anybody told you that if you, you know, come to Jesus and everything will be great after that, no problems anymore, they were lying to you. <laughs> they, they lied to you. We do people a disservice when we tell them that. Because when you come to Christ, you become the target of the antichrists, don't you? You become the, the target of the devil. You become a prime target. Satan doesn't tend to bother with those who are already in his kingdom. Why should he waste his time and effort and energy on those people? They're already spiritually dead. They belong to him. He doesn't need to waste time attacking them. So who does he attack? He attacks believers, those who follow Jesus. This is why we have a, a whole ministry, the Church Unchained. Luke 9, 1 and 2 ministries. 
geared to helping believers come out from under the attacks of Satan, who's lying to us all the time. Precisely geared to that because Christians are not experiencing abundance of life. Why are they not experiencing abundance of life? I asked that question a long time ago, and I asked God to begin to show me how to help people get to abundance of life. Christians, well, they're not experiencing it for a variety of reasons. The main reason is they're being lied to by the devil. Unclean spirits are working against them. Demonic entities, demonic spirits, they're very real, just like holy angels are real, demons are real. Well, what do demons do? We tend to think of it in an abstract way. Demons are liars. They lie to us. They whisper lies into our ears, and we have a thought about something. We, have, we perceive a thought. They lie to us typically as if they are we ourselves. They speak to me in the first person. They don't talk about, hey, Jim, you're an idiot. They say, I'm an idiot. That's how they lie to me, okay? And I hear, I'm an idiot. And I think, yeah, I am an idiot. No, I don't really. But uh, sometimes I think, well, that was a dumb thing to do, right? And, and sometimes it was a dumb thing to do. doesn't mean you're always being lied to by the, by the devil. But this is how the enemy typically works in, in believers. He puts a thought there. We perceive that thought. We think it's us thinking a thought about myself, and I believe that thought is usually a negative thought, and maybe it has to do with God, maybe it has to do with me, maybe it has to do with forgiveness, whatever it may be, and we hear that again and again and again and again all through our lifetimes, and we believe those things, and the devil keeps us down, and he keeps us in bondage to lies. This is what he does. Been doing this for 21 years now, over 21 years, setting people free from the lies of demons, the lies of, uh, of the enemy. Does that make me a crackpot? It makes me a follower of Jesus doing what he told us to do, all right? For much of the church, it makes me a crackpot. That's why the church is in so much trouble today, because we have no idea what to do with demons and what they do. And they're not like the Hollywood movies, typically. They're not super powerful. You know, everybody's scared to death of dealing with demons and the devil because they see Hollywood movies. It, 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 it serves the, the kingdom of Satan, those movies, they, because it magnifies him, makes him look terrifying. Why would you ever want to go against that? You don't want to face off with a demon. No, you have authority in Christ. You are already have authority over any demon on this planet. Already. Jesus said so. I give you power over all demons, power and authority over all demons, and to heal diseases. Now go proclaim the kingdom of God and heal. Right? This is what Jesus said. So anybody on the earth right now, any, any ground level demonic spirit on the earth, any, any demon on the earth, there are principalities and powers, it's a whole different subject, but any demon on the earth you have authority and power over as a follower of Jesus. No questions, no ifs, ands, or buts. They need to obey you when you command them. They won't. Initially, they'll try to resist you, but you just need to stand firm in your authority and tell them, no, I told you to do this. Do it. Because you have authority in the name of Christ. If they can cow you, if they can intimidate you, they'll try to do that, and they'll try to push you down and run over you. Stand your ground, and they will have to back off. This is what happens. We have that power and authority. Jesus came to give us abundance of life, and most of the church isn't walking in it. Why is that? Because there are antichrist spirits on the earth. They're working against Christ. They're working against his purpose. So Satan targets believers in Christ. He doesn't target his own. He targets us. This is what he does. He's making war against the church right now. That's what he does, because we're threatening his kingdom. He knows he's going to lose. He knows he's already lost. He knows one day we're going to finish this up, mop the floor with them. He knows that, and he knows he himself will be thrown into the lake of fire of the second death. He knows all that, but he's very angry about it, and he's out to get us as much as he can and hurt us as much as possible. All right, so Jesus warned us there would be opposition on the earth. Now, his warning follows the promise that the paraclete, the spirit of truth will come. So he promises the Holy Spirit's going to come, the paraclete, or the spirit of truth. He will bear witness to Christ. He's going to come. He's going to help you. But here's what's going to happen. And I'm telling you this to keep you from falling away. There's going to be opposition. People will kill you and they think they're doing God a favor. That's what's going to happen. So the Holy Spirit's going to bear witness through Christ, uh, through uh, his, uh, those people who belong to Christ. This is why the Holy Spirit comes to us. All right, opposition is to be expected in the end. Uh, they hated Christ. They'll hate those who belong to him. So we shouldn't be surprised. First John 2, 19 through 20. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. 
But they went out that it may, might be plain that they all are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all know. You have to kind of, kind of park there for a little while and, and, and hear that, the way John is trying to say that to us. They went out from us. We are just talking about antichrists have come. They went out from us. Who went out from us? Those influenced by the Antichrist. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, the same, they would have continued with us, but they went out that it might be plain they are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all know. Remember that whole idea of gnosis, knowledge? Here he says, you all know. How do we know? You've been anointed by the Holy One. All right? So they went out from us, but they were not of us. Well, who is they? Those influenced by the Antichrist, Antichrist uh, spirits. There's a breaking of koinonia. There's a breaking of fellowship that happens. The unity of the Spirit is broken. Now, the breaking of the unity of the Spirit is proof that they were not of Christ. Okay, you following me so far with this? How many church splits have you seen in your lifetimes? Now, sometimes they're genuinely, you know, believers who have just a different approach to things. They really do belong to Christ. And it's not that they're all antichrist <laughs> uh, when they leave. You can feel that way sometimes. Uh, but uh, it's, there, it's a breaking of unity of the Spirit. That's the problem. Now, Christians can break uh, Fellowship in the sense that they can say, look, I just believe uh, we need to do things this way. And you say, okay, but you can split amicably, can't you? You can if you're led by the Spirit of God, all right? There's an old joke about, you know, the way Baptists multiply, they, they multiply by division. That's a pretty poor joke, and it's not very funny, really, when you think about it, what it's saying, right? It's so true, though, isn't it? The Baptist church springs up here, then you got, you know, Literally, in the area I came from before I came here, there was a, there was a church I pastored at that point. They'd had a devastating split five years prior. A group of that went, uh, went from that church down the road, not far down the road, formed another church. And it was known as the New Baptist Church for a long, long time. <laughs> they finally changed its name. Uh, but you had the old one, right, that they came from, and you had the new one. You got churches right here in Fredericksburg. Old site, new site, right? This is, we multiply by, by division. Now, again, it may be healthy in some cases. Usually it isn't, unfortunately. And there are churches that will split deliberately to form new congregations, missional churches. And that's, that's healthy. That's a good thing. Uh, but too often there's this break that happens, like we see here that John is talking about. And what he's saying is, uh, they went out from us, they were not, of us. The fact that they went out from us is proof they were not of us. He says, for if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might be plain that they all are not of us. All right, you can, you can see when there's breaking of fellowship. Uh, usually you can tell who's being led by the Spirit of God, who isn't. If you have enough sense, then you know Christ yourself to begin with. Right? And that can be a problem, can it? Often people don't know Christ. They know religion. They know their tradition. They know their heritage. And so, you know, they're all on board with leaving that group in the dust. But if you know Christ, usually you can recognize. If you really know him, the way John is talking about, then you understand which group is on which side here. Which one's walking in light? Which one's walking in darkness? We're saved only by participating in the sacrifice of the incarnate God, Jesus Christ, who is the advocate and the expiation. We're not saved by a knowledge of mysteries, all right? So, so John's saying, okay, that group led by the Antichrists, they've left us, those of us who understood we're saved by Christ, the righteous, who's the advocate, and the expiation for our sin, they left us saying, you've got to be saved by knowing this. He said, that's proof right there 
They really weren't of us. All right. So I understand when there's a church split, you know, each group wants to say eh, that, you know, the other group, they're the problem, right? We want to point fingers at everybody else. And that's why there, there's some humility necessary here and, and some soul searching necessary whenever anything like that happens. But there's got to be the leading of the Holy Spirit. Isn't it interesting that the devil always wants to add something else to salvation? You ever notice that? It's not enough that Jesus Christ, the righteous, is our advocate and our expiation. No, you have to know this mystery. No, you have to live this way. You have to do this. You ha- the devil's always adding to the requirements for salvation. The pure gospel, the simple gospel is that we're saved by grace through faith. We accept the gift of God offered us through Jesus Christ. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. That's the gospel. The lie of the devil is, no, you have to add this to that (laughs) to be saved. He always wants to put some self-effort into it. Now, we do work out our own salvation with fear and trembling in cooperation with the work of the Holy Spirit. We've talked about that already in this series. Uh, we walk it out, as we've talked about with John. That's his expression for it. Paul talks about working it out. John talks about walking it out. That's all true. But again, don't put the cart before the horse. We're not saved by our effort. We're, we're saved. And then our effort is in pleasing the Father. And he works in and through us. So the devil always wants to add something else. And keep in mind this thought about the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk more about that. It's very important. But again, John sort of moves these themes in and out. And uh, it's not always like just straight line, logical um, writing. It's more that logic of the heart we've talked about. So 1 John 2, 21 through 22. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and know that no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. All right, so again, John's dealing with this heresy, this idea of Gnosticism, denying the uh, incarnation. We've got uh, additional things required now. Um, I'm writing to you not, not because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it. And you know that no one, that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. Truth is not just discerned intellectually. This is one of the biggest errors the Western church has fallen into. And it's so easy to fall into that. I like to think about things intellectually. I like to to think through things logically and so forth. But truth is not just discerned in that way. There's something more that we need. Christians must learn to trust the anointing of the Holy Spirit because he is the spirit of truth. And and the reality is that the truth of the gospel makes no sense logically from the flesh. No sense. The Apostle Paul talks about that. It's a stumbling block for Jews. It doesn't doesn't make any sense. It's folly to Gentiles, stumbling block to Jews. Uh, that God himself would become flesh and allow himself to be crucified on a cross and die this terrible, torturous death makes no sense. It doesn't, does it? From our point of view, it's not logical. And yet we've fallen into this trap as the church that we want to now reduce everything to intellect. And, and John is saying, look, I'm, I'm writing to you not because you don't know, but because you do know. How do they know? They've been anointed by the Holy Spirit. We've got to pay uh, attention to that anointing of the Spirit. So there's a deep witness of truth which is spiritually discerned. Now we have to be careful there because there are a lot of other groups that will say uh, they've had some sort of an experience and it's been a spiritual experience. I'm thinking of one group in particular and they'll tell you, go home and, and pray about it and if you have the warm feeling in your chest, you know, in your heart, then you know it's true. Well, it's not true, it's a lie. But a lot of people have been fooled by that. They have a spiritual encounter of some kind. Do you know that every spirit is not the spirit of God? Do you understand that? Who are we talking about here? Antichrist spirits, demonic spirits. The devil can do miracles. 
The Antichrist will perform miracles. The Antichrist, whoever that individual is, one day, he's going to perform miracles, signs and wonders, and people will think he's from God, or that he is God, because he's doing miracles. Every miracle is not from God. There are false spiritual gifts that the devil gives people to mess them up. We've had a person come in from ministry who, who had been taught by mentors to pray in tongues every day for an hour. And she did that. And what we discovered in ministering to her and actually encountering the demonic entity involved with that lie was she was cursing herself for an hour every day because she was speaking in tongues she didn't know. She thinks she's speaking blessing over herself. She was cursing herself for an hour every day. It's a false spiritual gift. These things can happen. We need to be careful. We need to have spiritual discernment. All right, so deep. there's a deep witness of truth spiritually discerned. Now note here the unity of the Father and the Son. Notice what John said. This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. The Father and the Son. Notice that fellowship again, koinonia. Father and Son have that fellowship. Jesus in John 17 prayed in Gethsemane that we would have that kind of unity that he and the Father had, that, that we would have that deep fellowship. So notice again the Father and the Son, and the truth will always point to Christ as the full revelation of God, the Father. All right, so important, but again, not just intellectual knowing. Verses 20 through 21 put it this way. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all know. I know I'm backtracking a little bit, because again, trying to track with John here. But you have been anointed by the Holy One. The word anointing means to smear or to rub. All right? You've had the Holy Spirit smeared all over you, <laughs> rubbed into you, okay? That's the idea behind the anointing. You know, we get into this whole thing about the anointing, the anointing, the anointing, and someone's always so anointed, and... Every one of us is anointed by the Holy Spirit. Every one of us. And we get into almost a competition of who's more anointed than, than who else, right? Especially in charismatic circles, Pentecostal churches, sometimes you get into this whole, whole thing about, oh, they're more anointed because, look, they do miracles. Well, who else can do miracles? I just said it a little while ago. The devil can do miracles. Just because somebody can do miracles doesn't mean they're from God. Come on, why is that? Why is that, church, Right? We're so easily fooled, so easily misled. Oh, miracle, got to be from God. No, maybe he's the Antichrist. Maybe he's the Antichrist spirit. It's a false miracle to deceive you. He may think it's genuine and from God, but you should have enough discernment to recognize it isn't. I've been in some of those meetings, and everybody there thinks it's from the Holy Spirit, and what's happening is from the Holy Spirit of God, and they're all oohing and on, and I'm not like, there. there's nothing happening up here that's from the Holy Spirit, nothing. This is all flesh being led by the Antichrist spirits. Unfortunately, that's very common, all right? We get into the flesh, we get into feelings and all that, and we, and we don't have that real discernment of the real truth in Christ. So you've been anointed by the Holy One, and you all know. This is John's point, okay? Reject this teaching, this false teaching. You've been anointed by the Holy One. The deep innermost convictions of your heart, your spirit should be telling you, this is wrong. You should be able to discern there's something wrong here. You may not be able to put your finger on it quite. Like, I'm not, I'm not sure what it is. But something's not right here. It took me a long time to really trust God with that one, you know? I would meet people and not like them immediately. And I'm like, that's not fair. <laughs> you're supposed to be a nice person if you're a Christian, right? You should like everybody. That's a lie. Uh, two right there, but uh, <laughs> but uh, I won't go any further with that one. But uh, you know, we're, Christians aren't nice. I mean, you know, people think that's the eleventh commandment: be nice. No, that's not. That's what qualifies you. No, but you are supposed to be like God, okay? And so, I would meet people, and I would just instantly dislike that person. And I'm thinking, what is that? You know? And I start finding a reason. I start trying to explain it to him. I said, well. Uh, I'm, I'm judging the person by something. Maybe I don't like that, or I don't like this, or, you know, whatever it is. And I would try to explain it away. And it, it, it took a few years of getting my tail kicked on this one to recognize that was the Holy Spirit. 
giving me discernment about that individual. Because what I would find out later, much to my chagrin, later, because I'd suffered in the meantime, because I had, I had talked myself out of it, this dislike, what I found out later was I was totally accurate to not trust that person because the Holy Spirit was warning me, don't trust this person, it's not genuine. And because I ignored it, I paid a price. So we've got to learn to pay attention to the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That's my point, all right? If something like that happens, you're like, why do I just not like this person? Start asking yourself, don't try to explain it away. Ask yourself, or ask God better. Uh, that's better, that's a better idea, now that I think about it. <laughs> ask God, why, why do I not like this person? Lord, is there something about this person you're trying to warn me about, right? I'm, I'm trying to help you out here not to make the same mistake I made, all right? Ask him, is there something here I need to be aware of? And listen to what he says. And trust him. Doesn't mean you hate that person. You know, it just means be, be, be careful. Be wary. This person is not who they seem to be. He or she seems to be, which can often be the case. All right? This spirit is not being led by the Holy Spirit of God. Even though, outwardly, they look anointed, but is it the anointing of the Holy Spirit? That's the question. We're so easily tricked by the devil. So he says, look, I, you've been anointed by the Holy One, and you all know. You should know. These people left us because they were never really part of us, right? I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know. You know it, and, and know that no lie is of the truth. What's the lie he's talking about? This lie, you have to have something added to the gospel. All right, so John the Elder affirms these people that he's writing to. He encourages them to trust the witness of the Holy Spirit within them. See, Christians can disagree. You know, that's a shock. Christians can disagree because we never have any disagreements here. Uh, Christians can, can disagree on non-central points, and that's okay. It's okay. And we can still have true fellowship, even though we disagree about certain things. But we must agree on who Christ is. We must. If you disagree on who Christ is, we're in two different camps, Right? John says, who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. You can't disagree on this and still be Christian. We can't be in the same family of faith when you're denying who Jesus is. When you're saying you have to have more to be saved than Jesus can give you, there's a problem. And we're no longer talking about the same gospel. We're not together anymore. And, and what we've tried to do is we try to have this big tent in Christendom, if there's such a thing anymore, there really isn't anymore, but in, in the church. Uh, and, and we say, well, everybody's welcome in this big tent. And you've got people on every side of every issue. I mean, diametrically opposite perspectives on abortion and other things. And they're all claiming they, that they're following Christ. Something ain't right here, folks. Something's wrong. Now, of course, I'm going to say, well, I'm right, and, and they're wrong. And they're going to say, no, we're right, and you're wrong. This is part of the struggle, isn't it? But what's the Holy Spirit of God say? Sometimes people are being led more by their own opinions and their politics and by other things than they are by the Holy Spirit. Do you really believe that God the Father, the author and creator of life, Thinks it's okay to murder babies in the womb? Do you, you really think that? That doesn't make any sense to me. But there are Christians who will adamantly support that. And I, I don't understand it. I really just don't understand it. So 1 John 2, 23 through 25. No one who denies the Son has the Father. He who confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, lives in you, remains in you, then you will abide in the Son and in the Father. Again, unity there. And this is what he has promised us, eternal life. So people who claim to know God but deny Jesus as the Son of God have rejected God because God the Father has revealed himself through his Son. John 10.30, Jesus himself said, I and the Father are one. You cannot deny Jesus as the advocate and expiation for our sin and have God the Father. 
It's not possible because God the Father has revealed himself through his Son, and Jesus said, I and the Father are one, and he said, I am the only way to the Father. But we have all kinds of people who claim to be Christians who say, oh, no, there are many paths to, to God. Many paths up the Mount L lead to God. No, they don't. Some of them lead you off the precipice and you fall to your death. We've got to wise up as a church. 1 John 2, 26 through 27. I write this to you. I write this to you about those who would deceive you, but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. Again, the anointing of the Holy Spirit and you have no need that anyone should teach you as his anointing teaches you about everything. And it's true. And it's no lie. Just as it has been taught you, abide in him. So what's he saying here? We don't need good teaching? Have I just preached myself right out of a job uh, up here? He's not saying that. Yes, we need training. We need to be discipled. But, but what he's saying is, look, you have the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You already know the truth. Don't be deceived by these people. Don't let others teach you out of the truth, which is what was happening. They already knew Christ. They knew that their salvation was in Christ, who had become man, had taken their sin upon himself, was our advocate expiation. And yet here comes this other group of teachers saying, oh, but you need this. Right? You need to add this. And he's like, don't listen to them. You know. You know by the witness of the Holy Spirit in you. You know the truth already. You know it. You know this is not right. This is where we need to pay attention. And when somebody teaches you something that's not right, even, though, even, if, you can't, even if you can't prove it intellectually at that point, maybe you have to think more about it, or whatever, and you have to research it. But when it doesn't seem right, trust that. Trust that impression because the Holy Spirit's telling you something. Don't believe that. The gospel is very, very simple. When everybody, whenever somebody comes along and complicates it, adds to it, and you have a bad feeling about that, this doesn't feel right, trust that feeling. The gospel is not complicated. It's, it's very straightforward. Doesn't make any sense from the flesh, but it makes sense from God's perspective because God is love, which we're going to look at later on in this letter, right? So if something doesn't seem right, it probably isn't. The devil is a liar and the father of lies, John 8, 44. The Son of God is known spiritually primarily. Okay, yes, God gave us minds to use. We should use them. We should, it's great to have discipline, you know, intellectually. That's wonderful. Uh, but primarily, God is known spiritually. And we can't lose sight of that. You can have all the greatest theology in the world intellectually, but if there's no spiritual heart connection to God, you're lost, you're dead. You're not saved by your head knowledge. And then wrapping up the letter, or this, this portion of the letter anyway, First uh, John 2, 28 through 29. And now, little children, abide in him, Abide in Christ. None of these other ideas. Abide in Christ. So that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who does right is born of him. So we see the love of the Father here, the tender mercies of God in the address of little children. It's an affectionate term from John the elder who knew the heart of Christ, uh, little children, abide in him. Again, the idea of fellowship, this constant state of readiness for Jesus' return. You know, if you're abiding in Christ, when he returns, if you're living in the truth, and when, when Jesus returns from the right hand of the Father, then there's no shame, there's no fear, because you're already abiding in him. Stay with him. When Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he, he, didn't, he didn't draw a map and say, here's how you get there, you know, turn right at, at the signpost and make sure you don't miss that turn. He said, I am the way. Stick with me. Stay with me. And I'll get you where you need to be. 
And what the devil does is he adds all this other stuff. And then we might get lost in the weeds somewhere. Just stay with Christ. Abide in him. That fellowship. Readiness for his return. There's no shame. We may have confidence when he returns. There's no, we won't shrink from him in shame at his coming. So there's no shame. There's no fear. 1 John 4.18, which is later on in the letter, of course, uh, he talks about this. He talks about there's no fear in this relationship because fear is about judgment. We're afraid God is going to judge us, condemn us. He said, if you know God, who is love, then you know there's no fear in love because it's about relationship with the God who loves us. And when we're in relationship with him, we're abiding with him, there's no fear when he returns. Because we already know he's not going to judge us in the negative sense and condemn us. He came to save us. So there's not going to be any shame at his return. Just abide in him. So right belief and good behavior go together. You may be sure that everyone who does right is born of him. Everyone who does right is born of him. Our behavior will reflect our salvation We are born of him. We are saints by God's gift. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for loving us. Thank you for sending your son to be the advocate, our advocate and our expiation. We thank you for the the other advocate promised to us, the Holy Spirit, who, who is here on the earth now, in us, living in believers. We thank you, Lord, there is no shame. That's Romans 8, 1 says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that in our relationship with you, there's no shame because of our sin. You've you've forgiven our sin. You've covered our sin because you love us so much. And we're so grateful, Lord. Lord, I pray for that anointing of the Holy Spirit that John talks about to be smeared all over the church, the people of God that it would be such a powerful anointing, such a deep anointing, so well applied and so well smeared into us, so every inch of us is covered, that we were not so easily misled by liars anymore. We're not misled by, by things or by false teachings. We're not deceived into thinking we have to add to what Jesus has done for us. That we simply just need to abide to abide in him, to, bear, to, to, to listen to that teaching of the Holy Spirit, the witness of the Holy Spirit in us, the witness of truth that we belong to him, that we belong to Christ, and not, not allow the enemy to heap shame and condemnation upon us and to try to separate us from Christ, but to know that we are beloved. We are beloved. And we don't have to keep trying to earn that designation through our, through our actions, trying to please a father who might otherwise be angry with us. Lord, help us to understand who we are, as John understood who he was, that we are the beloved. We are the ones anointed by the Holy Spirit. We have a deep heart knowledge of our salvation. And we are so grateful, Lord. Lord, we're grateful for, the, for your work, your activity in us that shapes us and, and our behavior follows our salvation, that, that, that our behavior more and more uh, comes to reflect who you are. We ask you to forgive us when we, when we slip up, when we mess up, and we do, Lord, too often. But we're so grateful that, that when we do, even though, as John said, he's writing so that we may not sin, but if we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Lord, we're so grateful that your son is so willing to forgive and wash us clean because of the great love you have for us. Lord, help us to just understand that we are your children, as John will be talking more and more about in the letter, that we are your children. You love us. Help us to walk in that awareness of who we are and help us to become more discerning in listening to the witness of the Holy Spirit in us 
even if we can't intellectually quite define what's troubling us about something, about a teaching or whatever it may be, about an individual, help us to, to pay attention to that witness of the Spirit in us, that something's not quite right, something's not quite right. And just to, to be careful, to be aware. Lord, we love you, we give you honor and glory. Show yourself in and through us, Lord. Thank you that we are carriers of your spirit wherever we go. As we walk in the light, we carry the light with us. We pray, Lord, that the light would multiply and increase all over this Hartwood area and that thousands and thousands would be drawn to you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Bless the Lord. We're going to be departing this location in just a moment. Uh, if you'd like to remain for prayer, you're welcome to, to stay. We'd love to pray for you. Also, uh, because of COVID-19, we're not fasting offering plates anymore. So as you know, we have our offering plates uh, in different strategic locations as you go out the door. Make sure you don't overlook those, but uh, there they are. Uh, and if you have an offering to bring to God today, uh, that is available to you. So, Lord, we thank you for the offering. We thank you for your grace, your mercy. And we seek that, uh, we seek to honor you, Lord, in giving back to you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We give you all glory and honor. Amen. So I go in peace, to love, and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. There's nothing worth more will ever come. Stop.